This Mexican lagoon is a nursery for giants. I'm on my way to meet creatures that make a fantastic voyage. It's the longest migration of any mammal. Here's some of the travellers now. They can grow over 15 metres long, weigh 40 tonnes. They're grey whale. I'll be joining them on their incredible journey. I'll be tracking the whales over land, on the sea and by air. Great view from up here. The giants and I will make our way over 5,000 miles from Baja, California in Mexico to the far north of Alaska. There they are. A route fraught with danger. My journey will take me through spectacular landscapes with wild and wonderful creatures. I'll meet people whose lives have been touched by whales. Whale watchers. Oh, boy, another new whale. Whale worshippers. These brave members of the tribe are making an offering to the whales. And whale hunters. Join me for an incredible journey. In this episode, we'll travel from a warm water lagoon and drive through Mexican deserts to the busy beaches of California, where the worlds of whales and people collide. It's early March. I'm in Baja, California, in Mexico, where my journey begins. I'm driving south along a long and skinny peninsula. Halfway down this finger of land, there's a magical lagoon close to the town of San Ignacio. In spring, over 300 grey whales assemble here expectant mothers to give birth, and other males and females to mate. Greys haven't been hunted here for decades, so most of them are unafraid. I'm hoping to meet friendlies, mothers and calves that have an extra special bond with people. But at first, we only see singletons. There's whales all around us now. One just blew there. Over here. Sometimes they lift their heads out to have a look around. It's called spy hopping. We can't harass them, of course. We've got to wait until they approach us. Wow, a real whoosh when they blow like that. It's a mix of vaporised air from the lungs, atomised water particles. They breathe just before they hit the surface, so blow up this explosion of water. The whale's massive lungs shoot out 100 gallons of used air in a second. The blow can be five metres tall, and you can tell the species of whale by the shape of the blow. Greys have a heart-shaped one. A mother and calf. Is this my chance to get really close? Oh, see the calf playing next to mum. It rarely leaves her side. Splashing the water seems to attract me. A mum and calf. Approaching the boat now, these are the friendlies we've been looking for. Wow, oh, here they come! I'm fizzing with excitement here. They're getting so close. Here comes the baby! <laughs> Hello there! <laughs> First contact! 
this baby is just three weeks old. to describe what they feel like. Sleek and smooth, a bit like a pilled hard-boiled egg. When they're born, they're five metres long and weigh half a tonne. Put on weight pretty quickly, suckling on their mum's rich milk. This is wonderful. Looking right into the eye of the baby here. The calf's just playing with us now, pushing the boat along. He's twisting, rolling beneath me. <laughs> That's like a puppy dog. This is remarkable, my hands right inside the calf's mouth. You can see and feel the tongue and the baleen plates. They hang down from the roof of the mouth. The whales use them to filter food when they're sucking in mouthfuls of sediment. And this one really likes the inside of its mouth stroke. Here comes Mum too. So immense. Whoa, that was a real shower. Whoa, a real fishy breath. Gotta be very careful stroking mum because the barnacles are quite sharp. While the baby's here in the lagoon, it will be colonised by barnacles. The larvae of the are in the lagoon now. Ready to settle on the whales. These barnacles don't grow anywhere else except on grey whales. They can have huge numbers of them. Sometimes they can carry a load of 20 kilograms. That's a quarter of my weight in barnacles. And they're not the only hangers on. Ah, oh, look at this, another parasite. It's called a whale louse. They're related to crabs and lobsters. Lives in amongst the barnacles and feeds on the scraps of whale skin. Lovely knotted markings on the skin. Whoa, look at mum spy hopping here. Great whales can see pretty well in air as well as underwater. She was having a good look at us then. <laughs> I love this contact as much as you do. Unforgettable. The mother and calf stayed close for nearly an hour. I'll never forget looking into that baby's eye. What a beginning. I'll be back to find out more in the morning. San Ignacio Lagoon in Baja, California. I'm visiting the place where the friendliest of grey whales begin their incredible migration. Yesterday, I had an astonishing encounter with a baby grey that left me wanting to know more. Anyone with a passion for whales should make a pilgrimage here. Tourists are thrilled by these experiences. Today, people value their close encounters with whales highly. In the past, humans only had deadly intentions here. Whalers slaughtered tens of thousands of greys. By the 1940s, only a few thousand remained. Protected since 1947, there are now over 22,000 greys. It's a great comeback. For researchers to keep tabs on their numbers, a photo record is vital. On the lagoon's shore, 
the nests of these birds are also closely monitored by scientists. They're ospreys. The desert here is peppered with them. One polishes off a mullet, it's caught for supper. The lagoon provides rich pickings for these expert fishermen. There's a higher concentration of ospreys here than anywhere else in the world. They even nest close to the research station of the biologists I'm here to see. Over three decades of studies, they've monitored the grey whales that return here year after year. Hi there, Steve. Very nice. Hi there. Good to see you. Good to see you. It's like a whale photo gallery around me here. Why is this identification work important? Well, the photos are like fingerprints, and they allow us to identify individual whales to know who's here, who's coming back. And in the case of the mothers with calves, it tells us how often they're able to produce a viable calf. And how often is that? It's on average every two years. Time for a whale's who's who. And do you give some of the whales names? Yeah, of course. Based on their scars and particular marks, we can name them as in coffee, because it seems like it had a grain of coffee on the dorsal, or, or also with their behavior, we can name them as, example, bumping in Spanish, topitos, because it kept on bumping on the boat. So. <laughs> <laughs> that looks a very distinctive mark. Well, we call this one hummingbird, because, well, for me, it looks like a hummingbird, this particular. That shape, yes. Yeah. <laughs> You'll be able to recognize this one in the years to yes. come. Yes, she's a mother this year. Identifying the whales and recording their sounds is straightforward. But there's still a big mystery to solve. Why are they friendly? We find it extremely fascinating, and I wish I could give you the exact answer, but we're still trying to figure it out ourselves. The majority of the whales are here to breed, and they ignore the boats. But there's that few that uh, thrill the whale watchers. They show a curiosity. They find something interesting, like a little boat full of people going ooh and ah, and a motor purring at a low frequency, which is what they can hear. They'll come up and investigate it, and if it doesn't frighten them, they'll stick around. Nothing is comparable to a 30-ton animal swimming up to you and nudging your boat gently when it could easily upset you if it wanted to. We find it extremely fascinating that such a large, wild, free-ranging animal will show such an interest in a boat full of people. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's inspiring. Another mystery researchers are investigating is how whales communicate. Their equipment can help me learn what sounds greys make and when. Shana, this is an impressive piece of kit. What does it, what does it do? So this records sounds on the bottom of the seafloor, and the primary reason for in this lagoon is recording grey whale sounds. Most people know about the, the songs of humpback whales. Mm -hmm. How do greys compare? Greys are very different than humpbacks. Humpbacks have long, drawn-out songs that are very beautiful. They can last for 45 minutes at a time. Grey whales tend to do more pops, moans, grunts. Have it's you got any recordings of them? I do. It's like a rumbling stomach. Mm -hmm. We affectionately call these congas. They sound like conga drums. Here are two whales there. So it sounds like two drums. <laughs> Yeah, it does. First time I've heard a grey whale, and that's oh, good. Uh, as you say, I think it's rather attractive. <laughs> I like it, but <laughs> it's still not in a relaxation tape. <laughs> the greys do their conga drum calls when they're socialising in the breeding lagoons. In the open ocean, they usually go quiet. Killer whales lurk offshore. Silence may let the greys pass unnoticed. There's no killer whales in the lagoon, so mother greys and their babies can get ready for the long swim ahead in safety. They'll be preparing for the next few days, so tomorrow I've time to visit a Mexican celebrity I've wanted to meet all my life. I'm heading across the Baja Peninsula 
to the capital of this Mexican state. I'm tearing myself away from the whales for just one night because I'm a reptile fanatic. Living here in Baja, there's one of the most peculiar reptiles on Earth, and I couldn't leave without going in search of it. It takes around five hours to drive across the narrow peninsula and to La Paz, a city on the eastern coast near the southernmost tip. After a gorgeous drive, I soon reach the cacti line shores of the Sea of Cortez. In La Paz, I wend my way through the city to the Calafia Hotel. My Mexican superstar lives nearby. This waste ground just behind the hotel is a real hot spot for one of the strangest reptiles on Earth. During the day, you find them by flipping stones Never seen one in the flesh. I'm really excited about this. They really are peculiar. Oh, look at this little scorpion. That's why I like looking under rocks. You never know what you're going to find. Lovely little thing. what I've been looking for. Surely one of the most peculiar animals on Earth. It's called the Mexican mole lizard. If you look closely at the front of the body, it's got two legs with five toes, which it uses for burrowing in the soil. This one's full grown. They don't get much larger than 20 centimeters or so. Tiny eyes covered in skin. Obviously, if you're spending all your life underground, you don't need to see very well. This feels really weird. The mole lizard's moving in my fingers. So its body's sort of working like a concertina. That's how they progress through their tunnels underground. Mexican mole lizards will track down their prey by scent. They'll tackle small insects, any creatures that they can overpower. That is the cutest face. Baja Peninsula is the only place that you can find these lizards. The Mexican mole lizard. Let's put him back under his rock. I'm so glad I grasped the opportunity to see it. I'll be meeting more amazing creatures on my journey north. But now I want to catch the whales preparing to leave the lagoon to begin their long migration. I'm hoping my guide, Ranalfo, can help me find calves learning the skills they'll need for their 5,000-mile swim. We're heading out to calves at the mouth of the lagoon En route, a rare event this late in the year catches our eye. Now I've spotted a real frenzy of activity over there. It's a group of mating whales. I wasn't expecting this because most of the males and newly mated females have already left to head north. Really showing off, putting their fins and tails high into the air. Two or three around the female, pushing each other, vying for her attention. Look at this here. The males are really getting excited. Just saw what the scientists call the pink Floyd. 
in a male grey whale, it's nearly as long as I'm tall. The female will probably mate with each of her suitors. Usually, the last one she mates with will father her calf. And females that mated last spring travel back here to give birth. In this lagoon, there's quite a lot of training going on. The mums are preparing their newborn calves for the marathon journey ahead. This is a really unusual sighting here. The whales rarely feed when they're in the nursery lagoon. There's a mother and calf. Mum's rolled on her side. She's scooping up sediment from the bottom, filtering out any small animals that it contains. But there really isn't that much food here. The adults won't get a square meal until they get much further north. Perhaps she's teaching her baby how to feed. The calf's copying her every move. Perfecting this technique will be crucial in the coming months. Grey whales aren't the only marine mammals in the lagoon. There's a pod of dolphins over here, bottlenose dolphins. They're fishing. One went right on its back there to catch a fish. This is the whale's gym. Calves do stamina exercises here. Some more training going on here. There's a mother and calf. The tide's coming in. She's swimming with baby against the current. They're not moving very far. They're almost stationary, in fact. This is like an underwater treadmill. She's getting her calf fit for the long journey ahead. All around, mum and calf pairs are working out. There's a mother and calf travelling with real purpose here. For the baby, training is over. You can see the breakers up ahead. They're leaving the safety of the nursery lagoon, heading north out into the Pacific. Their numbers are swelling. The mums choose a high tide and a calm day to lead their babies into the open ocean. Time for me to leave with them. I'll be keeping them company all along their migration route. I'm looking forward to the unusual creatures people and spectacular scenery on the way. On Mexico's Pacific coast, the male grey whales and newly mated females have left the breeding lagoons for the Arctic already. Now the new mothers and calves are setting out in a second wave, following the west coast of America. I've joined them on their epic journey from Mexico to Alaska, but I'm taking the road north. My route takes me past an outstanding local building. San Ignacio's church was built by missionaries in 1786. I'll soon be back in the empty desert of Baja, California, while the grey whales are swimming parallel with me along the coast. It's around 500 miles from here to the US border. As I follow the whales on the journey north, there'll be plenty of other wildlife along the way. This whole area is protected. Desert and the whales' breeding lagoons are all part of Mexico's Vizcaino Biosphere Reserve. Not only the whales find sanctuary here, other special mammals are safe too. A big herd of Baja California pronghorn here. 
second fastest land mammal on Earth. They can attain speeds of 88 kilometers an hour. Great distance runners too. They can keep going all day at half that speed. You can really see how they get their name. Their horns look exactly like prongs. There's a little calf bleating over there. Must be less than a day old. <laughs> Unsteady on its feet, but in two or three days, that little baby will be able to outsprint me. Pronghorns have their babies at the same time as the grey whales. Twins are rare. A single calf is more usual. It's great to see these. The Baja California race of the pronghorn antelope was critically endangered. In 1997, there were only 75 left, but with conservation efforts, their numbers are improving. Now, there's around 800 or so. I'll see other conservation success stories like these and the grey whales further north on my journey. For now, I'll just keep my eyes peeled. The rattler in the road. And this is a beautiful Baja special. Just catching the last rays of sunshine in the afternoon. Oh dear. Warning me with that rattle. It's called the red diamondback rattlesnake. And is only found here in the south of the Baja Peninsula. Immaculate markings. These lovely diamonds along the body. That's how they get their name. Diamond back. This is a female. Males have much longer, more slender tails. And in the autumn, she'll give birth to a litter of six to 12 babies. Rattlesnakes don't lay eggs. They give birth to fully formed young that are replicas of the adult. She's about half grown. Diamondbacks can grow to a couple of meters a little longer than I'm tall. Oh dear me, she's getting a bit close to me now. And I've got to watch out, of course, rattlesnakes have a very toxic venom, which affects the nervous system of anything they bite. And if you didn't get treatment, you'd die within a couple of days. And it would certainly do a lot of damage to my tissues. A snake of this size would feed on rats and small rabbits. They really are the farmer's friends. They're perfect rodent hunters. I'm going to let her go by the side of the road because some people still think the only good snake is a dead snake and they intentionally run these beautiful creatures over. Lovely. The rattlesnake's gone off into the desert. There's another beautiful reptile here. It will have warmed up during the day, so it's going to be pretty fast. But let me see if I can catch it. Yes! Hey! You nearly got away. I've got a handful of cacti spines. This is another Baja endemic. Spiny tail iguana. Jet black throat and tummy. And really warm to the touch. It's been basking in the sun all day. Which is why it was pretty fast. I was lucky to catch this one. They really are very speedy. I've got to watch those jaws. These iguanas have a pretty powerful bite. Their main defense is this tail. If they're attacked by a predator, they lash that from side to side, hitting their attacker in the face. And it's a pretty formidable weapon. But I don't want to be bitten or clubbed by you. <laughs> Let it go back to sleep. It's great to think of the whales moving up the coast just over there. While I've paused on my route north, 
the greys haven't stopped at all. During the hours of darkness, they make the same speed as in the day. Tomorrow, I'll find a way to check up on the whale's progress. I've heard of a spot on the coast where I should get a good view of them. Most of the first wave of migrating adults are already much further north. But I may well see stragglers or the second wave of mothers and babies. What's so fantastic is that greys often swim so close to shore anyone can watch them from beaches and cliffs. Fabulous, the first time I've seen greys in the open Pacific. There's a little group moving here, hard to see where there's a mother and calf. There's two or three travelling together, sometimes they travel alone. Every now and then you see a spout when they breathe, or if you're really lucky, a glimmer of the back as it breaks the surface. After watching the whales for a while, you can predict where they're going to come up and get good views of them as they break the surface. They're not making deep dives now. They left their Arctic feeding grounds five months ago and haven't had a square meal since. So they need to conserve energy. I'll be taking fewer breaks today, so I'll be eating up the miles through the vast plains. covering the journey northwards a little bit faster than the whales are with stops I can do about two to three hundred miles in a day. Adult greys cover around a hundred miles every 24 hours. Mothers with calves move much more slowly making 50 miles in a day. certainly journeying past some of the most beautiful landscapes in the Americas. I'm heading to Catavinia now, which is right in the middle of the desert. When I reach the town, I'll have completed about half of the journey to the US border. Once again, I find myself in a strange environment. A sea of surreal plants. Many of them are only found here on the Baja Peninsula. Grey whales are the giants travelling up the coast. But here in land, there are giants too. This is a cardon cacti. This is a small one. Look at this one here. They're the largest cactus on Earth. They can soar 20 metres into the sky, weigh 25 tonnes. They dominate the landscape here and often form mixed forests with other plants. Look at this one here, one of the most peculiar plants I've ever seen. They're called boujum trees. Looks like an upside down carrot. You can see the twigs coming willy nilly from the stem. After rain, leaves sprout within a day or two. But when drought conditions return, they wither and die. <laughs> These strange things can grow to 18 meters. They were first discovered in 1922 by Geoffrey Sykes, a plant hunter. He named them boujums 
after the mythical creatures in Lewis Carroll's children's book, The Hunting of the Snark. They really are fantasy plants. Baja's bizarre botanicals grow right across to the Pacific. It's time for me to head back there. I have a whale mystery to clear up. From here up to California, the road north hugs the Pacific coast. My next stop is Ensenada. The swirling waters and islets of this rugged coastline have fired up people's imaginations for centuries. The migrating whales and their water spouts are often in view. There's lots of local legends associated with them. Look at this here. Second largest marine geyser on Earth. The blowhole sprays water more than 30 metres into the air. When early peoples first saw this, it reminded them of passing whales. Was this a ghost whale spouting for eternity? The jet of seawater is actually caused as air trapped by waves explodes in a sea cave below. From Ensenada, a freeway takes me quickly north again. On our parallel journeys, the Wells and I, <laughs> approaching civilization now, we're about 30 miles from the US border. You can see how it's getting built up along the coast here. It's the whale's first brush with human development. The adults swim further out, straight across bays. Mothers with calves come in closest, following the surf lines. For the first time, they meet strange sounds, dirty waters and debris in the sea. They press on towards Tijuana, Mexico and the US border. America is just ahead. The whales will be swimming in the Pacific from Mexican waters into American ones. No immigration formalities for them. No passport required for whales. But I'll have to undergo a three-hour wait before I can even show my documents. Once across the border, we're LA bound, where there'll be new experiences for the gray whale calves. Travelling through a busy playground and fishery brings its own set of hazards. I'm in California, following the grey whales making their way north to Arctic feeding grounds. What a contrast to the sparsely populated deserts I've just passed through. Almost four million people live in LA. Most are unaware of the giant mammals migrating right past their doorstep. For the whales, traveling through these busy coastal waters can be hazardous. Greys are occasionally struck by boats, but the biggest threat is from fishing gear. Worldwide, almost a 1,000 whales and dolphins die every day when they get tangled in nets. This is one of the lucky ones. It's been freed to continue its journey. It will join many others passing the cliffs at Palos Verde. People who really care about whales gather here to look out for them. Whale Rock, a local landmark, is well known to the observers here. They're a dedicated bunch. 
Name tolls commemorate whale watchers past and present. Elisa Shulman Janiger is the leader of the whale watchers. There's a big, big group there. How, how many people watch the whales? Uh, we've got uh, about 100 different volunteers this year. They count the whales moving up the coast and pass the number on to other monitors further north. They're always looking for new enthusiasts. Someone can just come off the street, pick up a pair of binoculars. We could kind of give them hints of where to look and how to look, and they could help contribute to science. And how, and how many whales do you see a day? 20, 25. We did have a record for the season, which was 50, which was this past Monday, which was fantastic. Joyce, Lisa, what, lots of dolphins out there, a big, big school of oh, dolphins. What yeah. are they? That long, stretched out line, and they're pretty small. They look like common dolphin. Do they pass the point every day? Just about every day. Last two yeah. years. Oh, boy, another new whale. It's just passing Whale Rock. I can just see the back. And that's number what of whales today? Uh, we've had eight so far, so that would be number nine. That one seems to have a square of white on its back. Yeah, so. a huge white patch, which is really fantastic for identifying individual whales. We could take photographs of that and then match it with uh, people up and down the coast to see where this whale might have been seen before. They find watching an effective way to monitor the growing whale population, and exciting too. You let out a whoop of joy, oh. what happened? Well, the, nail, the whale that was heading northbound took a sharp turn to the left and it just was exciting. It was unexpected. Yeah, and what did you see, the fluke or uh, the... I, I watched him and then he took the deep dive and I saw the fluke. Yeah, so how long have you been watching them? Oh, about three months. Yeah. I'm the newbie here. Yeah. <laughs> I've learned a lot though, these ladies have been really helpful. Yeah. They're really knowledgeable. What is it about whales that attracts all these watchers? I just think there's something kind of very majestic and beautiful and kind of it's amazing that you know they are, live right in front of us like this and travel up and down the coast yeah. and how long have you been watching here uh, this is my 17th season 17 years yes yeah. yeah and you've never counted up how many gray whales you've seen <laughs> about uh, six years ago I started counting them I'm at like over 8,000 or something like that you've seen 8,000 why do you adore whales I don't know what's so special about them. There's a connection. That's, you feel, you... It's they're looking at you and you're looking at them and they're curious about you and you're curious about them. It's kind of a mutual thing. We've just traveled up from the breeding lagoons. I'm never going to forget that contact with the mother and calves. It's, yeah, it's wonderful, yeah. isn't it? And yeah, we were down there this year with uh, the great granddaughter. She was her first try. And it's so... remarkable that you're watching the same whales come yep. up here now. Yeah, yeah. Terrific. You see why so many people come down to see them. This is a, a wonderful experience. Oh, it's fantastic. And we're just 45 minutes drive from downtown LA. That's it's right. Yeah. Fantastic. It's great to see the Greys' population count is healthy and heartwarming to think that these travellers have covered over 600 miles so far. Grey Wells and I have finished the first leg of our journey. Next time, we'll continue up the Pacific coast of the US. I'll visit the whale's world and witness humpback acrobatics. Wow! The sound it makes! I'll also meet some real charmers, sea otters. I'll glimpse condors overhead and at rest. I really didn't expect to get this close to one of the rarest birds in the US. And encounter the Grey's biggest natural threat. Killer whales. The whales and I have got an incredible journey ahead of us. See you next time for another whale adventure.
And Nigel's back with his new wheel adventure Tuesday at 8. Later tonight at 9, the start of the new Killers Behind Bars with Professor David Wilson beginning his investigations with Levi Belfield. Next, Potter's Bar beckons for Dom and Melinda on the trail of another new cowboy builder.